Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. It's really nice when childhood friends have equally good lives. Augustine thought as he approached the restaurant where Eustasio was waiting for him. If Eustasio were less successful, what would they have to talk about? The rich don't know how to be friends with the poor. Even if they want to, it never works out. Envy creeps in and unintentional displays of wealth. And worst of all is realizing that your childhood friend, with whom you used to catch fish and butterfly nets, is just a lazy weakling. Yes, by the age of 35, Augustine had acquired a few unshakable beliefs. The first and most important of them was that poverty in 8 out of 10 cases is the result of laziness and spinelessness. But fortunately, none of this applied to him and Eustasio. They each found their own way up. Augustine ran his own contemporary dance theater. Eustasio's business was pretty grim, but ultimately it would survive any crisis. Eustasio owned a funeral home. Yes, it couldn't compare to the festive atmosphere in Augustine's theater, but it was still a necessary business. How do you stand all this? Augustine once asked his friend, You go to work every day. And there are coffins, morgues, makeup artists dolling up the deceased, and the mourners sobbing in the viewing room. You could get depressed from all this. Eustasio shrugged. Depressed? Maybe you could, but personally, I prefer to embrace philosophy. People die, whether we like it or not. My employees do everything to send someone to the afterlife with dignity. And at the same time, we try to spare the loved ones as much trouble as possible. They can mourn their loss in peace. There's no need to think that it's better to distract yourself so you won't feel the pain. First, it's a lie. And second, feeling pain is important, Augustine. You know how often it happens? People bury their grief deep inside, try to drown it in distractions, and then bam. They end up in a mental hospital. Knowing how to grieve is just as important as knowing how to be happy. That's what I think. And we give those who have suffered such a loss the opportunity to go through it without being distracted by things like searching for a suit for the deceased, finding makeup artists, or a burial plot. After listening to his friend's speech, Augustine didn't argue. And there was no need to Eustasio was right. Augustine simply decided not to bring up the topic of his friend's work anymore. After all, they had plenty of other common topics. Eustasio was waiting for him, passing the time with a glass of wine and a phone call. He was probably addressing some issues related to his gruesome business. But upon seeing his friend, he immediately hung up the phone and stood up. Hey, Augustine. The old friends embraced. Look at you, still hitting the gym. Augustine chuckled, giving a friendly punch to Eustasio's steel biceps. Do you want to stay forever young? I can't compare to you. Eustasio replied, not to be outdone. Well, you're doing great, still getting your Botox shots, while I can't make up my mind about it. Unfortunately, Augustine sighed with mock sadness, nobody stays young. Look at you, you already have some silver in your hair, and it seems like baldness is just around the corner. This was a typical exchange for them, without which no meeting could begin. After finishing this introductory banter, the friends finally sat down at the table. So, did you just invite me here for a chat, or is it business related? Augustine asked. Although, why am I even asking? It's clear it's business, or else I would have just come for a visit, right? Exactly, Eustasio smiled. I have a business matter to discuss with you, and it's strictly a man's business, no need for your Paulina to know about this. You see, a few months ago, I met a girl. Augustine knowingly chuckled. And now you don't know how to break up with her, huh? Guessed it? But Eustasio shook his head. No, not exactly. I already know how to do that. It's something else. He began to tell the story slowly and in great detail, and as Augustine listened to his friend, memories of their shared childhood suddenly resurfaced. Eustasio had always been like this. He tried to analyze any situation in detail, taking all circumstances into account, and only then make a decision. There was no spontaneity in him, 
but his decisions were always well considered and he rarely made mistakes. Remember, I decided to take a break around New Year's? Eustasio recounted. I flew to Thailand for two weeks and there were beaches, clubs, and beach clubs. That's where I met her in one of the clubs. A pretty girl, legs, breast a dancer. A stripper, Augustine clarified. Eustasio nodded. Yes. Well, you know how it is. They're not allowed to show any affection at work, but I could tell she was interested in me. I caught her eye. So, I thought, what the heck, I'm a free man. I waited for her to finish her shift, and that's how we met. Turns out, she's Russian. Her name is Nora, and, of course, she didn't end up in this line of work because life was treating her well. That's where it all started between us. Then I said to her, why stay here? Come with me. She agreed. I rented an apartment for her, and everything was fine between us for another month and a half. But then I realized, it's not for me. She was cooling off too, I could see it. It started with her finding fault with this and that. This is wrong, that is wrong. And in general it was cold and boring. In short, it's time for us to part ways. Well, Augustine didn't quite understand. So, you're parting ways. What's stopping you? Eustasio didn't reply immediately. He took another sip of wine, lost in thought. You see, he finally said, Nora is from a small town, a simple family. I showed her a beautiful life, and now I'll just leave her. What will she do? She'll find herself a wealthier man, and in the end, she'll end up down in the dumps. You know how these things go. I would really like her to have some meaningful occupation, to live with dignity, to respect herself. And maybe, somewhere along the way, she'll find a good, decent guy. She's a dancer, and she mentioned that she's always dreamed of dancing in a respectable place. Perhaps your contemporary dance theater could find a place for her. Augustine pondered this for a moment. I'm more involved in the business side of things, Eustasio, he said. Paulina is the one who heads the choreography. It seems our dance troupe is already full. But let your Nora show us what she can do. If she proves herself. Eustasio smiled. I knew you'd say that, which is why I asked Nora to come along. And here she is already. Augustine suddenly noticed a tall brunette in a red dress approaching their table. He stood up to greet her and was left speechless. Her wavy dark hair cascaded down her shoulders, her coffee-colored eyes with upturned corners were captivating, enticing, promising. The young woman also had a golden-hued skin that seemed almost magical. Is that her? He croaked, looking at Eustasio. Is that her? The woman approached them and leaned in to kiss Eustasio on the cheek. What Augustine noticed in the deep neckline during this moment made his breath quicken. Let me introduce you, Nora, Eustasio said. This is my longtime friend Augustine. He manages a contemporary dance theater. The beauty turned to Augustine and cast a languid look at him from beneath her thick eyelashes. Eustasio has spoken to me about you. Her voice was soft and intimate, as if she weren't currently greeting a stranger but whispering to him in a bedroom between kisses. I've also heard about you. He awkwardly got up from the table to pull out a chair for Nora. Please, let me, here, have a seat. The young woman thanked him with a smile, and from that smile, Augustine felt a tingling sensation almost physically coursing through his body. He had never experienced anything like it before. Never. He didn't notice the anxious look on his friend's face or the fact that the waiters, passing by their table, were quite visibly smirking. So, Eustasio told me that you're a dancer? Nora sadly smiled and lowered her gaze. Once I was a dancer, but then I had to undress to the music. You can't even call it dancing. If it weren't for Eustasio, she gently touched her benefactor's hand. I don't know how I would have escaped from that swamp. He saved me back then. I still don't know how much he paid the bar owner as compensation for me. Let's not dwell on that. Eustasio interrupted her. Bars, compensations, that's all in the past. We're here to figure out how we can get you back to dancing. 
Augustine, who had been listening as if spellbound, suddenly stumbled upon those words. Indeed, how? Doing this without involving Paulina was impossible. So, what was he to do? Losing Nora, this heavenly creature, was out of the question. He had to find a way to keep her. We'll come up with something, he promised the girl. Tomorrow, let's say around 11, come to the theater. Show yourself to our choreographer, and we'll brainstorm what we can do for you. Now I should go, Eustachio immediately got up. Nora, stay, order whatever you like. Put it on my tab. They walked out onto the street, and Augustine was surprised to find that it was already dark. It seemed he had completely lost track of time. Well, of course, he couldn't take his eyes off Nora. How could he have noticed anything else? Paulina must be waiting, I suppose, he muttered, reluctantly remembering his wife. Augustine. Eustachio looked at him knowingly. You have a great wife. Remember that, okay? Don't forget. Augustine became cautious. Had he fallen in love so obviously that even Eustachio noticed? That was the last thing he needed. Why did you just say? He asked, trying to sound surprised, like a faithful husband who was unjustly suspected of having feelings for another woman. Eustachio couldn't help but smile. As a man to another man, I understand you, he replied calmly, anyone would be smitten with Nora. I've been through it myself. But honestly, getting involved with her seriously is more expensive. She's not worth a nail on Paulina's finger. Don't get upset, I'm just being friendly. Friendly time to piss me off, huh? Augustine chuckled. Forget it, I'm not a fool, I won't trade my Paulina for anyone. All right, take care. I'll pass your greetings to my wife. Nora, without much interest, toyed with her salad, pushing the plate away. She had completely lost her appetite. It was clear that Augustine had his eyes on her. Now he would do everything to get her a job at his theater. Now it was essential to play her cards right, keep his attention. And most importantly, keep him interested, not sparing any advances. Then, in due time, she would become more than just an attractive doll, as she had been until now, but a significant, prosperous figure. It was a pity, of course, that she would have to part with Eustachio, she liked him. But he was just too independent, too difficult to control. But Augustine, something told her that she could pull the strings with him. And that was precisely what she needed. Nora nodded at the waiter. Take the salad and bring me bolognese with mushrooms and cream sauce. And red wine, your choice, I'm not a connoisseur of alcohol. Anything else? The waiter asked politely. Cucumber and tomato salad, Nora snapped, with greens and mayonnaise dressing. Don't ask stupid questions and get my order. Her mood had improved slightly. Life was like a zebra. Not long ago, she was doing striptease and living in a dirty shack on the outskirts of civilization. But then she met Eustachio, and now she was living in a nice, albeit small, apartment, dining in a restaurant. Great. And when she realized that Eustachio was losing interest in her, she hadn't had time to get upset before Augustine appeared. And with him, she had a good chance to make something of herself. No, things were definitely going quite well. Nora took a sip of wine and smiled. It was exactly what she needed. Tangy, moderately sweet, and, in the end, it somehow reminded her that real people eat and drink. A dancer had to watch her figure, but was it human to eat nothing but chicken breast and leafy salads? In her youth, Nora loved fried potatoes, white bread with butter, and ice cream. She hadn't had any of those in about five years. The limit of what was acceptable was one chocolate cookie a day and a glass of wine on weekends. Although, she'd probably have to give up wine too. Lately, whenever she drank even a little, nightmares would follow. But today was a special occasion, right? Special meant it was okay. To new opportunities. Nora silently toasted. As Augustine had suspected, Paulina had already begun to worry. Of course, she didn't make a scene, as that wasn't her style. 
Augustine couldn't even remember if they had ever had any arguments in their married life. It seemed they hadn't. Now, Paulina calmly read her book and showed no signs of irritation upon seeing her husband. I was starting to worry a bit. What if something had happened? She smiled. Why didn't you call? I'm sorry, Paulina. Augustine lightly kissed her cheek. Paulina was so simple and warm. She was like a clove growing by the house. You look at it, and your soul feels calm because it's familiar and native. Even her appearance was somehow soothing. Her nose, lips, hair, no sharp lines, no striking contrasts. Blue eyes, wavy brown hair, skin kissed by the sun. In moderation, everything is harmonious, he always said about Paulina. Or maybe she's just plain. Augustine suddenly thought out of nowhere and was scared of that idea. No, no, that's nonsense. Paulina is fantastic. Faithful, honest, hardworking. Steady, finally, and that's quite a lot by our standards. Yes, women like her are worth their weight in gold. This inner monologue somewhat reassured him, and Augustine even managed to smile at his wife. I'm so happy when you're waiting for me at home, he said, almost sincerely. I was delayed because Eustachio dragged me to a restaurant just before evening. I was already on my way home when he caught up with me. Well, she seemed genuinely disappointed, Eustachio. Why didn't you invite him over? We haven't seen each other in ages. Childhood friends. Well, don't be mad at him, Augustine chuckled. He also wanted to meet you and sends his regards. But you see, this time he had a delicate request, in general. So he was sure you would refuse. By the way, I'm also sure of that, and I told him so right away. But he made me promise that I would still talk to you. So, what kind of request was it? What did he want? Help hiding a body? Rob a bank? What? Well, no, no. Paulina, it's much simpler. He asked to find a place for one Sonora, his acquaintance, and our troop. Who is this girl? Paulina asked. Here, Augustine needed to be very careful not to arouse any suspicion, not even the slightest. To buy some time, Augustine poured himself some water and sat down opposite his wife. It seems to me that she's his mistress, he said nonchalantly. I didn't bother to find out the details, but I have a hunch about some things. He pulled her out of some shady place, cleaned her up, and fed her. Eustachio says it would be good to give her something to do, you know, to keep her from harm's way. She might slide down to dumps, and that would be a shame. But if he's so concerned about her, Paulina reasoned, he could help her get an education and find a job. Augustine, I understand Eustachio, and I even support him. He's doing the right thing by not wanting to abandon the girl to her fate. But why does he want to place her with us? She dreams of dancing with us, and she seems to have some training. She's probably not that talented, but she's a friend's request. Will you take a look at her tomorrow? Maybe we can find something for her. Well, Paulina drummed her fingers on the table and thought, she tapped out some kind of dance rhythm. I can't promise about the performance lineup, she said. But let her come and rehearse. We'll start with the chord ballet, and we'll see how she does. Thank you, my dear, Augustine beamed. Then I'll freshen up and go to sleep. Feeling a bit tired. And only when he was alone, closing himself in the bathroom, he could finally relax and congratulate himself on his victory. Paulina, apparently, didn't suspect anything. She even promised to help. Of course, this conversation didn't go without mentioning the magical name of Eustachio. Yes, indeed, either childhood friendships end with childhood or they last a lifetime. But the main thing was that everything worked out. He managed to have this risky conversation with his wife and came out on top. Well, that was wonderful. He did well. Augustine understood that today he didn't just manage to pull the wool over his wife's eyes, he fulfilled a friend's request. And at the same time, he managed to have Nora close to him. Now she would be nearby. Strangely enough, he was thinking about her calmly right now, without any feverish excitement. This girl was impossibly beautiful, like a dream. 
Maybe tomorrow, when they met again, he would be surprised at what he had found in this sweet but ultimately ordinary girl yesterday. It was quite possible that in the daylight, he would discover she had a pimple on her forehead or even a few. Or that her lips were chapped. Augustine contemplated this and hoped that's how it would turn out. He had never in his life thought he would so eagerly anticipate disappointment. But now, disappointment was the only thing that could help. Because if tomorrow's meeting didn't disappoint him, then... How could he live then? As for Nora, she had another nightmare. She returned to her hometown, only to find it deserted. The houses on familiar childhood streets had open windows, with darkness and silence behind them. It was immediately clear that there was no one there, not a soul. Only an old carousel creaked in the yard, spinning on its own, as if ghosts were riding it. At that moment, Nora always woke up and lay with her eyes open for a long time, still hearing that frightening, dead squeak. This cursed dream drained her nerves periodically, approximately once every few months. And she couldn't get used to it. Today the nightmare was unusual, it had new details. Walking through the empty town, Nora kept turning around, someone was calling her by name all the time. She couldn't recognize the voice, although it seemed familiar. And then suddenly she realized that these calls were someone's malicious prank meant to scare her for good so that she could never leave this place then she decided not to pay attention to them but the person who came up with this trick wasn't a fool either now they were calling her from all sides and the voices calling her multiplied echoing and giggling nora sat down on her haunches near the creaky carousel and covered her ears with her hands and then she woke up I will never go back there, she thought. She repeated this calming mantra again and again, which usually helped. But today, something went wrong. Nora wrapped herself in a blanket and went to the kitchen. Coffee, the girl promised herself. Strong with milk and sugar, and some cookies. She wanted to drive away the cold melancholy brought by the dream. Warm up, remind herself of the present of the restless city outside the window of chocolate cookies. Dash, you seem to be here and not here, Eustachio said at some point. Like you're in two worlds at once. Nonsense, she smiled. She didn't even want to admit to herself that he was right. And she lived like that, all correctly. There was the outside world where one had to know how to get by to achieve anything, and there was another world that Nora never told anyone about. In her secret world, her beloved cat was alive, and a shaggy black dog ran around the yard with a loud bark. There, in the summer, flowers grew along the fence, and in the winter, there was white snow like a fluffy blanket. Nora, a girl from the outskirts, in a calico dress and barefoot, weeded the flower beds and looked at the gate. Soon, her friend would come, and they would go together to the dance classes at the local cultural center. After another concert there, she met Eugenio. She hurried down the stairs and seemed to bump into an invisible wall when she saw him. How handsome he was. Blue eyes like the sea, which Nora had only seen in pictures. He was so tall that she had to tilt her head up to look at him. Eugenio noticed this and descended a couple of steps. I saw you on stage, he said, smiling. The smile was so cheeky that Nora laughed. He was lying, the scoundrel, and he didn't even blush. What dress was I wearing? She asked, hoping to catch him. But the trick didn't work. Red, the guy replied without hesitation. You had a flower pinned behind your ear right here. He playfully tugged at her ear. Okay, I'll walk you home. It's getting dark. He threw his jacket over her shoulders, took her hand, and led her home like a little girl. It was so unusual, funny, but also very, very exciting. Nora saw how passing girls curiously looked at Eugenio. And for the first time, she walked down the street with a young man who wasn't her relative or classmate. Walking around like a couple, she awkwardly joked. So we are a couple, Eugenio replied as if it were self-evident. And then, when it was completely dark, they kissed for a long time right by Nora's gate. And the girl didn't care that now rumors would inevitably spread through their private sector. Let them talk. Is it important when the most long-awaited adventure in the world happened to you, love? 
In just a week, everyone around considered them engaged. And a month later, Eugenio climbed over the fence at night and knocked on the sleeping Nora's window. What? She asked sleepily without figuring out what was going on. But when she saw Eugenio's pale face with sweat drops on his forehead, she understood. Trouble had struck. I lost money, Nora. He barely managed to say with trembling lips. The girl silently poured some water into a mug and handed it to him. The guy eagerly gulped down the water to the last drop and wiped his mouth with his hand. What an idiot. I said I'll give it away. So give it. She still didn't understand what he was talking about. Give it away, and that's the end of it. Eugenio groaned deeply, grabbing his head. What kind of fool are you, Nora? I don't have any money. I was gambling on credit. Now, if I don't pay, it's over. They'll cut me to pieces. All right. He caught his breath, looking at Nora with inflamed, painful eyes. Here's the deal, Nora. I need to leave. Right now, today. Forgive me, okay? And forget about me. Wait. Nora touched his forehead, wiped away the sweat. Wait, Eugenio, how can I forget? How much money do they need? I'll get it, I. Where? He whispered loudly. Where will you get it? Tell me. Where? Well, we'll find it somewhere. She threw off her nightgown and within a minute was dressed to go outside. Let's go, she whispered. Let's go through the window. The only person with money that the girl knew was the choreographer of their dance classes, Xavier Moreno. No one knew for sure where he got his money. Some said he made moonshine and sold it. But Nora didn't pay attention to those rumors. Moonshine existed beyond her world, just like the people who needed it. Xavier. She knocked on the choreographer's window. There was light inside, and voices from the room reached her. Is he having guests or something? Xavier, it's Nora. Eugenio hissed something incomprehensible at this point. Nora. Be quiet. She snapped at him. Xavier, I need money. I have nowhere else to go. Please, open up. The window swung open. What do you want, Rodriguez? The choreographer asked irritably. Making a commotion here in the middle of the night under an honest man's window. Xavier, I need money. Nora blurted out without beating around the bush. In the room behind the window, male laughter rang out in unison. Xavier casually waved his hand to his guests and everything fell silent. I, I need a lot. The girl continued. I have to. Eugenio, how much do you need? She looked over her shoulder but didn't see her friend anywhere. Eugenio. Nora yelled at the top of her lungs, completely forgetting the time of day. Eugenio. Here he is, the choreographer said calmly, seeing the pale, trembling figure of Eugenio peeking out from behind the corner of the house. Xavier looked at Eugenio's lanky, disheveled appearance with visible disdain, his hair in disarray. What a jerk you are. She's running around other people's houses at night looking for money, and you're afraid to show your face in the light? So you, he addressed Nora, because of him? He needs money? The girl nodded. I see. All right, wait here. I'll be right out. Let's go, Nora. The guy tugged at her sleeve. She silently pulled her hand away. The door opened, and Xavier, dressed in casual sportswear, slowly stepped onto the porch. Is he, my dear girl, he began, piercing the exhausted face of the boy with his gaze, by any chance, and did it to someone? No? Well, it doesn't matter. I'll tell you myself he owes me, Nora. And you, silly girl, instead of running through the streets at night, would be better off going to sleep. No one forced him to gamble. He messed up on his own, so let him deal with it. Xavier, I'll work it off, Nora said firmly. I can clean for you, cook, and take care of the garden. And you'll die of old age before you pay off his. 
The choreographer pointed his finger silently at the half-dead Eugenio. Dead. And in that time, he'll rack up even more. Do you plan to be his servant forever? Do you even know who a gambler is, huh, Nora? Listen to some good advice, go home, sleep, and forget about that idiot. I won't go. She shouted. Xavier, what do you have in life besides work? No wife, no children. But I, I know you have love. So why don't you see who you ended up loving? There he is, your beloved. Nothing to say, huh? He's the one who's now setting you up. He's not thinking about where to get the money. He's not offering to work for it. And you. And he's just standing there, pretending to be an innocent lamb, waiting for you to do everything for him. You're just. All right, he cut himself off. Forget it, you don't hear anything. So, if you want to help him, I'll send you abroad. I have a friend who owns a bar there. You can work as a dancer for him. He'll provide you with housing, and you won't have to pay for it. We'll split your salary like this, half for your living expenses, half for your dog's debts. Are you in or not? Make up your mind quickly. People are waiting for me. I'm in. Nora blurted out without hesitation. And only then, on the way home, did she suddenly realize that there was no turning back for her now. Soon, she would leave this place, and for two long years, she wouldn't see these streets, her little bright room, or her beloved. Not even the cat and the dog, she wouldn't see them either. Eugenio silently walked beside her, and Nora really wished he would encourage her. Say something affectionate, or at least hold her hand. But he continued to walk, kicking the gravel with his feet and occasionally sighing heavily. Will you wait for me? She asked timidly. He just snorted. What else can I do? I'll wait, of course. You'll come back, and we'll get married. Nora smiled slightly at that, get married. Now it would be a little easier for her to live these two years. It's always easier when there's something to look forward to. The gravel under their feet rustled too loudly for a summer night. She had given her house, the one she lived in, to Eugenio, and not without a hidden agenda, let everything around him remind him of her. Nora hoped that her beloved would call her every day, but alas, there were problems with that. She called him more often, and even then, Eugenio made excuses about urgent matters. I got a job at the automotive depot, he reluctantly muttered into the phone. Well, you have to work, right? Okay, Nora, I have to send the guys on a trip. Goodbye. She felt she couldn't help but feel that something was wrong. She wanted to drop everything and rush home, but what remained of her salary was barely enough for the most meager food. The bar owner, Pablo, gave her a nasty smile when she asked for a raise. You see, Nora, I'm barely making a profit as it is. There are few customers, just locals. And what can you get from them? You know for yourself, we make money from tourists, but it's not the season now. Where am I going to get more for you? And then, he lowered his voice, you should think about it yourself. Other girls will find out that I pay you more, and they'll demand a raise too. Am I an oligarch to you? Does money burn my hand? No, 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 Nora. Don't even come to me with that question. Look, have a drink on the house and leave it at that. And that was the end of the conversation. Fortunately, some well-to-do guy, Eustachio, came to their rundown bar and, seeing the beautiful stripper, quickly settled everything with Pablo. A few days later, Nora was already walking along the dusty road to her home. Nothing had changed here in two years. The gate wasn't locked. Nora entered the yard and didn't hear the cheerful barking anymore, and the dog's kennel had been moved somewhere. She absentmindedly looked around, not recognizing her familiar nest, and didn't immediately understand what had happened here. The skeleton of the house, charred black, stood right in front of the girl, and only the surviving porch was almost untouched by the fire. Three steps, and you were in the hallway. And on this porch, she used to sit with a glass of milk and a piece of bread. The familiar porch. But now it led to nowhere. Back already? 
It's been a long time since we saw you. Nora turned around and saw her neighbor at the gate. Yes, nothing changes. Natalia is still round and her kerchief on her head is the same, white with tiny blue flowers. Nothing changes and everything changes. Hello, Natalia. What's happening here? The woman sighed heavily and waved her hand. Can't you see for yourself? Oh, what a disaster. Your Eugenio started a fire here while drunk. The whole street rushed in. They barely put it out with the help of the firefighters. How did? He was out here with some girls. Nora flinched. With whom? You're lying, Natalia. Aren't you ashamed? You're a grown woman. But the neighbor wasn't embarrassed. Ask anyone, she gestured broadly to the street. He started partying like a madman as soon as you left. And then, there you have it. The whole house burned down, and he disappeared into the bushes. He hasn't shown his face here, Nora, and you say I'm lying. People say. What do they say? Nora interrupted. Natalia, what do they say? They say. Oh, why hide it? It seems he married a wealthy girl, the daughter of the market director. Rufina, I think that's her name. A chubby one, well-fed. Well, why should she be thin? After all, she's not poor. Why not enjoy some good food on her daddy's money? The whole town buzzed about their wedding. They celebrated it in the best restaurant. Eugenio is unrecognizable now. He used to be a simple guy, and now he looks down on everyone, acts all high and mighty. And that chubby Rufina clings to him, hanging on his arm. She clings, you say? Nora remembered Rufina from their dance group, plump, clumsy as a log, a girl who couldn't even mimic the simplest moves. But for some reason, they always included her in the performance groups and even gave her leading roles. Of course, the girls whispered among themselves, but no one openly protested. Everyone knew who Rufina's dad was. They also knew that a car from the market director came to the cultural center every Saturday, and a planned distribution of delicacies would commence. The director of the cultural center, the choreographers, and even the security guards got their share. They never forgot the alcoholic cleaning lady either. She always received two bottles of wine, white and red, several bottles of vodka, and, of course, ten bottles of beer. Such an island of abundance in a single house of culture. So, my Eugenio married this little tubby? And she's clinging to him? Unbelievable, I can't believe it, Nora mumbled. Natalia nodded sadly. It's true, Nora, that's how it is. Believe it or not, it's as it was, and that's what I'm telling you. Her father sent them on their honeymoon. That's what my Katerina told me. You know she works at the airport. She saw them there herself. She even arranged their tickets. And they have the same surname now, and she saw their wedding rings with her own eyes. I understand, Nora replied dryly. Where did they fly to? The neighbor thought for a moment. I don't remember. It was something like, well, what is it? A word that starts with T, Ta. Thai. Thailand, Nora prompted. Thailand. Thank you for telling me, Natalia. I'll be on my way. The woman watched her go, frowning and muttering something soundless. Either she was praying for something, or she was lamenting. She oddly enough met Eugenio on the same day. On her way out of town, Nora stopped to refuel. Suddenly, she saw Eugenio in the adjacent car. He turned to her gaze, and his face twisted in annoyance. Damn it. He burst out. Ignoring this peculiar greeting, Nora nodded calmly. Hello, Eugenio, and good day to you too. I see you're back already? How was Thailand? Personally, I think it's too hot there and the insects can bite. Did your wife complain at all? He looked away. Why do you do all this? He asked reproachfully. For what? Don't you understand anything yourself? He spoke so wearily and disappointingly. I don't understand, Nora raised her voice. 
but there's something else I understand very well. I understand that for almost two years, I've been busting my butt to pay off your gambling debts. I also understand that I ate sparingly and lived in a room infested with cockroaches. But through it all, I thought it was all nonsense because my dear Eugenio was waiting for me at home. I understand that I counted every penny, forgot about sleep and rest, all the while thinking, who cares, my beloved is waiting for me at home. And my beloved set my house on fire so that I no longer have a home, and he doesn't care one bit. Why would he think about me now? His social circle has changed. And anyway, he married someone else. That, Eugenio, I understand. But what you're saying, no, I don't understand. I must have become pretty stupid. Did I ask you to do this? He exploded. Did I ask you? Remember, you decided it all by yourself. And now it's my fault? You know what? Nora, blame yourself instead. Don't involve me in this. You suddenly became a sacrificial lamb. You traded your maidenhood for the one you loved, and he didn't appreciate it. Now I'm supposed to cry here out of injustice. After delivering his furious tirade, Eugenio took out his snowy white handkerchief from his pocket and wiped his forehead. Your presence is raising my blood pressure, he complained. And you told me you'd wait the girl said, her voice betraying a tremor. You said I'd come back, and we'd get married. Eugenio smirked cynically and harshly, causing his still youthful and handsome face to contort and suddenly age. What did you expect me to say? That I don't need a promiscuous bride? That the girl I loved suddenly decided that stripping was a good business? That marrying someone like that means not respecting oneself? Was I supposed to say all that to you? That's enough, Nora. We've talked, and that's it. Go wherever you were going. That's how this story ended, Nora thought, as if she were discussing a book she had just read rather than her first love. Nora never allowed herself to cry once, even though tears choked her all the way back in afterwards when she was sitting in the apartment she had rented, waiting for Eustachio. They met again, quite by chance, once more. Nora and Eustachio were at the theater when Nora caught a piercing gaze from the adjacent box. Upon closer inspection, she recognized Eugenio surrounded by his new family. His wife's parents were there, trying to look like avid theatergoers, which only made them appear pompous. Rufina, Eugenio's wife, was still as plump and heavily made up as before, but now she was adorned with even more diamonds. She clung tightly to her beloved husband Eugenio, constantly fixing his hair and brushing off invisible specks from his shoulder. She paid no attention to the stage at all. Eugenio was clearly bored. Besides struggling with his formal attire, he frequently adjusted his tie and fidgeted with his jacket. Nora noticed that he was not accustomed to suits either. He kept fiddling with his sleeves, trying to get comfortable. Once, while brushing his wife's hand away from his freshly oiled hair, he gave a disgusted look at his own palm. Yes, the high society life was a novelty for all of them. Eustachio leaned in and whispered in her ear. Who's that guy in the adjacent box, Nora? He can't take his eyes off you. Nonsense, she replied in a whisper. A former classmate. During the intermission, Nora left her box and immediately ran into Eugenio, who seemed to be waiting for her there. I see, he smiled, you haven't lost yourself in this life. High society life, theaters, ballets. Have you found your place in the big city? Wishing you the same, she casually retorted. Eugenio remained unfazed. And who's with you in the box? Sugar daddy? He may not be much, but he's getting up there in age, Nora, too old for you. Are you not limited by money at least? Is he spoiling you? No less than your little potbelly. By the way, how well is she treating you under her watchful eye? Haven't racked up any new debts, I hope? At these words, Eugenio visibly tensed, and Nora noticed his fingers nervously fumbling along the row of buttons on his jacket. So, back to debts, just like old times? Nora said with satisfaction and returned to her box. But late at night, Eugenio, clearly drunk and miserable, began calling her relentlessly. 
I didn't want to marry Rafina, he slurred into the phone. Believe me, Nora, I even thought about running away. But her father has money, and I. You know who I am. A card shark and gambler who burned down my house, Nora coldly recited. Well, yes, yes. I was so ashamed in front of you. You sacrificed so much for me, and I was terrible. I couldn't even wait for you, and I couldn't control my gambling. When I sat down to play, I kept thinking, maybe luck will be on my side, and then I'd take the first plane to Thailand and get you back, and we'd get married. Nora, can you hear me? Nora, I can hear you, she replied. And then, then, after I got married, I was afraid to see you. I was so ashamed that you started appearing in my nightmares. My wife almost had me committed back then. I spent a month in a mental institution. They examined me, probed me, gave me some pills, but the nightmares didn't stop, Nora. I just stopped being afraid of them. She chuckled. Then they finally released me. And when I sensed I'd see you soon, I kept avoiding my own shadow. I thought you might pop out from any corner. And we met like this at the gas station. Nora, don't believe what I told you then. It's sickening even for me to remember it. You know, you're the most important thing. Remember, I only loved you the best I knew how. Only you. He finally hung up, or perhaps his phone ran out of battery, and Nora sighed with relief. Loved or not, what difference did it make now? Nothing remained. Neither love nor a home to return to. Nothing but nightmares. But from that day on, a fierce hatred of the rich, who had never experienced the humiliation she had, took root in her heart. If only I had money back then, she often thought, a lot of money. I wouldn't have had to go to Thailand, do stripping, or endure the dreadful return to my hometown where I'm not needed by anyone. And would Eugenio have dared to treat me like this? Well, yes, he turned out to be a scoundrel. That's true. But if I were a rich Kaya, I wouldn't have known about it. We would have gotten married, and he would have carried me on his shoulders for the rest of his life, just like he's doing with Rufina now. It would have been wonderful to return there completely differently. A rich girl who throws money around left and right. Then he would have crawled to me on his knees, begging for forgiveness. Augustine, it's become impossible to work. Paulina complained. Her husband looked up from his documents. Paulina always maintained subordination in the theater and never barged into her husband's office without going through the secretary. What's wrong, Paulina? He asked sympathetically. Sit down, would you like some coffee? Listen, Augustine. She said with an angry, ringing voice. At Eustachio's request, I took this lady into the troupe, as we agreed, for the corps de ballet. But she's an hour late for every rehearsal, is rude to the choreographers, and behaves like a prima donna. I won't even mention her skills, they need improvement, but that can be worked on. But for that, you need to put in effort, Augustine, and not laze around. In general, Paulina finally sat down in the chair offered to her. I don't know what to do with her. She's rude to the girls. There have been two fights in the dressing room already. The lateness, well, I've already mentioned that. And recently, just the day before yesterday, literally, she was walking up the stairs. The cleaning lady was mopping the floor there. And what did Nora do? She kicked the bucket with a flourish and walked on, all satisfied. A whole bucket of dirty water, Augustine. What are you suggesting? Should we fire her? Paulina shrugged. I don't know. If we fire her, Eustachio might take offense. But leaving everything as it is is not an option either. I'm just exhausted after these two months. We have a premiere coming up and half of my energy is spent on trying to make Nora behave decently. I'm just very tired. And you know as well as I do, if there's someone like that in the group, everyone will loosen up. One rotten apple spoils the whole barrel. Augustine listened to his wife, nodding in agreement with her words. Well, all right, he said conciliatorily. Let me try talking to her myself. Maybe she'll listen to me. 
Do as you please, but I wouldn't count on much if I were you. Paulina got up and went to the door. Send her to me, Augustine requested. Okay. Nora appeared a couple of minutes later, gliding into the office with a sway of her hips that immediately caught Augustine's attention. Who is this girl? Everyone comes to rehearsals dressed modestly, and look at her. That crimson shirt is stretched so tight over her chest it might tear any moment. And these pants of hers? Well, anything that can be seen and even what can't is all on display. You're being a hooligan, kitten. Augustine smiled and stepped closer to give her a hug. Nora didn't seem to like that idea. Your domestic mouse told me you wanted to see me, she said, taking a seat in the chair. Paulina, Augustine corrected her. All right, the girl agreed. She kicked off her shoes and propped her feet up on the table. Your domestic mouse Paulina said you wanted to see me. Why? Augustine covered her bare soles with his hand. You can't be so careless, Nora, he said dash. What if someone hears you? Let them hear, she purred. We've been together for two months already, Augustine. It's time to stop hiding in corners. Besides, everyone around us has already figured it out. Not yet. We need to. And one more thing, she pouted her already plump lips. Why is she always bossing everyone around? I understand, she's your ballet mistress, an important figure, and all that. But I'm not just any Jane. I'm your favorite woman, right? Yes or no? Yes, my dear, it's all true, but... He caressed her leg. How could he explain it all to her? You're not thinking of getting a divorce, are you? She asked. No, Augustine admitted. It's not about you or her. It's just that I've invested so much in this theater, and in case of a divorce, Polly and I will have to divide it. With Polly, Nora snorted. Look at all this affection. He quickly corrected himself. With Paulina. But it doesn't matter what you call her. What matters is that I, and therefore you, could end up without the theater. That's something to think about. And don't think this won't affect our incomes. The girl yawned demonstratively. Honestly, I'd be better off staying with Eustachio. He may be a mortician, but at least he's a free man without wives and other pets. Nora, Augustine said reproachfully. But it was as if she hadn't heard him. What's there to catch? Your fool parades around with pursed lips all the time. And she just picks on me for no reason. You're afraid of getting a divorce. So what's the point of me hanging around here? And in the corps de ballet, no less. No, Augustine, you do as you please, but I think I'll leave. There are no prospects here, just nerves. She got up, stretching with feline grace. Don't call me. Nora. Augustine grabbed her hand, desperation in his eyes. Nora, wait, let's talk. What else do you want? She said, looking at him with a contemptuous smile. Augustine saw it, understood, but he didn't care. Let her despise him, let her not consider him a man at all, whatever. But she should stay with him. Her gaze, her warm skin, those tender lips, everything had become a drug for him, without which life lost all meaning. I've never loved anyone like I love you, Nora, he confessed. All sorts of things have happened to me, good and bad. But to go crazy like this over a woman, never. And I, I can't live without you. If I think you've left me, what's the point of living? Fool, she said almost tenderly. What will change in a week, a month, even a year? You'll still be shaking with fear for this theater, hiding from your wife all the time. I don't want that. I'll come up with something, Augustine repeated. Just wait a bit longer, just a little longer. Exiting the office, Nora nearly collided with Paulina. Is Augustine free now? The dancer shook her head wearily. No, and damn him, when will he finally be free from you? Although personally, I wouldn't mind. Paulina was taken aback. What are you saying, Nora? Are you showing up to work drunk now? I'll talk to Augustine right away. 
Go ahead, talk to whoever you want. Have a conversation with your own brain, if you have one, of course. I'm fed up. Nora snapped. If you're such a blind fool that you can't see Augustine loves me and you've got him sick of you. She walked past, brushing past her rival's shoulder. I'll never set foot in your stuffy theater again. She yelled as a parting shot. Dance on your own without me, and I won't be missing. Paulina stood frozen in front of her husband's office door. To say she hadn't noticed anything would be a lie. She perfectly understood the reasons why Augustine took his phone with him even to the shower and his sudden outings that extended into the late hours of the night. Of course, she had her suspicions, but she preferred not to dwell on them. After all, thinking and knowing were not the same. The one thing she could never have guessed, however, was that her husband would have an affair at work. Somewhere on the side, perhaps, but right in front of her. Paulina turned and, without looking into Augustine's office, headed for the exit. As always, in moments of serious turmoil, she only wanted one thing, to get home as soon as possible. Augustine, hearing her footsteps recede, breathed a sigh of relief. He was sitting at his desk, looking at a message from his lover, I figured out how we can make it all work. Let's meet in half an hour by the pharmacy across from the theater. I'll be waiting, don't be late. Paulina had no desire for her husband to return from work. Moreover, she hoped he would be delayed again. She had never been good at or enjoyed having confrontations. And if she thought about it, did she even have any reasons for that? No, there were none. And now, all of a sudden, they had appeared. What was she supposed to say to her husband? Darling, I know you're involved with someone else. But what if he denied it? That would be so easy. Or another, even more idiotic option, Augustine, do you have a mistress? Yes. Is it Nora? Yes, it's her. What to say next was a complete mystery. Or something else. Her thoughts were interrupted by a phone call. Paulina mechanically picked up the receiver. Yes. Hello, field mouse. Nora's voice on the other end of the line was surprisingly cheerful. So, have you finally realized, you blockhead, that he doesn't give a damn about you? And he won't give a damn as long as there's a woman like me by his side. You're not by his side, Paulina snapped. But Nora only laughed even more brightly. That's for now, but not for long. Okay, I'm done with you. Ciao, loser. And Nora hung up the phone. Paulina unexpectedly chuckled to herself. Everything that was happening, these conversations with Nora, her unrestrained rudeness, it all seemed so absurd that it involuntarily made her laugh. And Paulina laughed. She laughed loudly until suddenly tears welled up in her eyes. Fortunately, Augustine hadn't returned yet, and there was no need for Paulina to lock herself in the bathroom to cry in peace. Her life with her husband couldn't be called happy, but it wasn't unhappy either. Augustine had been driven for success since childhood. An honor student and the only gold medalist in their graduating class, he excelled in sports, particularly in dance and athletics. He was an avid reader and, in the later years of high school, was the first to enroll in preparatory courses, not at the urging of his parents, but on his own accord. This was why Paulina had always been more drawn to Eustachio, the carefree and cheerful one. They had been friends since early childhood, Augustine, Eustachio, and Paulina. Augustine often joked that he remembered his wife before he even remembered himself. In their trio, Augustine was the most serious, Eustachio the boldest, and Paulina was simply the company's adornment. Together, they were never bored. Remarkably, over many years, essentially from kindergarten until their high school graduation, no one had ever managed to infiltrate their close-knit circle. Then came the day of their high school graduation, and Eustachio left. Paulina experienced his departure as a true tragedy. She never told anyone, not even her mother, that she had been in love with Eustachio since middle school. And after graduation, he surprised her by announcing that he was leaving, probably forever. For some reason, Augustine wasn't very puzzled. Perhaps they had already discussed it without her. 
Paulina decided that she would definitely come to the train station to see Eustachio off and at least say goodbye to him. On that morning, she got up very early, but only to properly style her hair, choose the right dress, and do her makeup. She wanted Eustachio to remember her as beautiful. Very, very beautiful. Augustine had promised to pick her up around half past eight, but he called at eight. What, sleepyhead, still in bed? Augustine asked cheerfully. Well, don't cry, Eustachio isn't upset. He asked me to say hello to you. What do you mean, hello? Paulina was bewildered. You said his train was at nine in the morning. I'm all ready and just waiting for you. Well, damn, it must be your nerves playing tricks on you. I told you several times that Eustachio decided to take the night train. Augustine laughed over the phone. No, Paulina, you really got something completely wrong. But how could I, Augustine? I. I even wrote it down. She argued, realizing that none of this mattered now. Eustachio had left anyway. You know what? Go back to sleep, Augustine suggested. Your exams have really taken a toll on your mind. You need to rest, Paulina. Get some sleep and everything will be fine. And in the evening, if you want, I'll come by and we can go for a walk, get some fresh air. Yes, let's go for a walk. Paulina hung up and stared at her reflection in the mirror. She found her attempts to look nice pathetic now. Her hair, her dress, the slightly tinted lips, all seemed like a rejected gift. One that had been carefully chosen, beautifully wrapped, and then glanced at briefly before being tossed into a pile with cards and silly souvenirs. Eustachio had left. There was no need to fuss over her appearance anymore. Paulina lay down on the bed and cried into her pillow. At the same time, Augustine ran a comb through his hair and left the house. It was just shy of nine o'clock on the clock. He still had time to reach the train station and see his friend off. That evening, Augustine didn't linger anywhere. He entered their apartment and cheerfully called out from the doorway. Paulina, I'm home. Where are you? She was about to reply that she was in the kitchen, but changed her mind. He would find her eventually. Paulina, are you asleep or what? What's going on? He peeked into the bedroom, didn't find his wife there, and muttered something under his breath, seemingly offended. Finally, he made his way to the kitchen. Oh, there you are hiding. Augustine exclaimed happily. Why aren't you answering? I've been calling you and searching the whole house. Look, I have a surprise for you. With a magician's deft gesture, he pulled a box of chocolates, adorned with a huge bow, from behind his back. Your favorites. I know, I know, you're not supposed to have sweets, you have to watch your figure. And that's absolutely right. But, well, these somehow caught my eye, and I couldn't resist. Paulina nodded in gratitude for the gift. Shall we have some coffee? Augustine placed a cup in front of his wife and untied the bow on the box. Go ahead. Indulge yourself. There's no harm in having a couple of chocolates every couple of months, right? Come on, a few candies won't hurt. Your lover called today, Paulina said without looking up from the table. Her husband chuckled as he poured coffee. Really? Which one this time? I've had about 8 or 12 of them in the past week. I can't quite remember. Stop fooling around, she pleaded. Please. It's Nora. Paulina finally picked up a chocolate and nibbled on it absent-mindedly. Continuing the conversation and sharing everything she had heard from that audacious girl today was just too heavy. Nora? Augustine said in astonishment. Wait, are you trying to tell me that you believe I'm involved with Nora? Her? He leaned back in his chair and burst out laughing. Well, my dear Paulina. He managed to say between fits of laughter. If you're going to make something up, why choose Nora? I expected more imagination from you. Because, his wife replied calmly, she, she spoke with me today, and... Paulina waved her hand in the air. Augustine, I'm feeling so groggy. Help me, I can't even make it to the bed on my own. 
Let's go, Paulina, let's go. BRR. It was so cold. Paulina woke up from the chill. What an awful chill. She muttered. Augustine, could you turn up the heating and give me a blanket? It's freezing in here. There was no response. That was frustrating. Oh my God. Paulina thought. Why is it that when you need someone, they're nowhere to be found, but when you don't need them, they're all over you? She opened her eyes, tossed the sheet aside, and sat up. What? Paulina didn't recognize her bedroom, white tiled walls, a white tiled floor. She was sitting on a hospital gurney, and there was another one beside her. The person lying on it was covered entirely with a sheet, even their face. This is some kind of nightmare. She whispered. It's just a dream. This is crazy. In the silence, her quiet voice seemed deafening. It bounced off the walls and resonated. What on earth is going on? Augustine. Oh God, what is this? Am I in a morgue? Paulina jumped off the gurney, accidentally bumping into the neighboring one, and finally understood everything. And once she realized, she covered her mouth with her hand to stifle a scream of horror. A human hand with ashen, lifeless skin had slipped out from under the sheet. Paulina rushed to the locked door and pounded on it with her fists. Open up. Is there anyone in there? Can you hear me? Open up, for God's sake. I'm alive. Open up immediately. Somebody. Hasty footsteps could be heard behind the door, and it swung open. A very frightened young security guard stared at Paulina with wide eyes. What are you doing here? How did you? We'll figure it out in a moment. She shouted, rushing past him. Call your supervisor right now, and for heaven's sake, lock up this morgue. Paulina looked around. She had seen all of this somewhere before. These familiar surroundings. Is Eustachio in charge here? Him? Well, tell him that Paulina has been locked in the fridge. What? Which Paulina? Just tell him, and he'll sort it out himself. Call him. The young guard, still not entirely composed, stared at her, his finger pointing at the numbers on the phone screen. Finally, there was a response from the other end of the line, and Paulina stopped pacing around. Quite a display case you have here. She remarked, looking at several coffins lined up along the walls. Your boss runs quite the cheerful business, young man. He said he's on his way, the guard mumbled. Were you sleeping or something? Paulina asked sternly, Did you see anyone here? No one, he replied, wrinkling his forehead. I would have noticed. But the morgue has a back door. They bring deceased in from there. I see, she sighed. Do you have any coffee? After all, I've been lying in the morgue, not on the beach. Eustasio arrived half an hour later and froze in place at the sight of Paulina. She was still shivering, pale and vigorously rubbing her hands together you know he said looking bewildered i was hoping until the last moment that all of this was some silly prank i wish i could think that too eustachio what's going on i'm so lost i don't understand anything eustachio walked up to her wrapped his jacket around her and gave her a tight hug let's go to my office paulina you'll warm up and we'll have coffee Right now, I don't understand anything either. Do you remember anything at all? How did you end up here? Well, I was at home, and then Augustine came. We had coffee and were talking, and then... Eustachio. She stared at her friend in shock. Eustachio, I think I get it now. Augustine brought a box of chocolates. We were having coffee with chocolates. With chocolates, Eustachio. And? He didn't understand. What does that have to do with anything? I ate one of the chocolates, just one, and my head started spinning. Everything got blurry. I asked Augustine to help me get to the bed. There was something in those chocolates. Do you understand now? Okay, let's assume that's true, Eustachio nodded. 
So, your head was spinning, and you went to lie down. But how did you end up here? Paulina helplessly covered her face with her hands. I don't know. I really don't know anything, Eustachio. Maybe I'm going crazy? He gently patted her head. Paulina, I've come up with something. I'll go to your place. No need. There might be, there, oh. It's necessary, he said with a gentle firmness. Necessary. Tell me, who else might I encounter there? Paulina rubbed her forehead. Well, there's Nora. I didn't want to tell you. I didn't want to. In short, Augustine and Nora. I understand. No need to continue, Eustachio interrupted. I've got the gist of it. Paulina shook her head. How absurd all of this is, and shameless. She raised her tired eyes to Eustachio and suddenly smiled. So why did you need to leave on the night train? Maybe if I had come to see you off, everything would have turned out differently. Night train? He asked, surprised. I left on the morning train and was really disappointed that you didn't come to say goodbye. Augustine told me that you had caught the flu and had a fever. Augustine said that? What flu? What fever? I jumped out of bed early, did all that primping, so you would remember me like this. Then he called, scolded me for not seeing you off, for not coming to the train. He even said that I messed up everything. That he told me about the night train. So, he just didn't want us to meet, right? But why, Eustachio? We were always the three of us together. And Eustachio suddenly remembered that last summer they spent together when Paulina's parents took her to the seaside and he and Augustine, 17-year-old boys, went to his grandmother's cottage. They had everything they needed there, endless skies above, green forests all around, and plenty of lakes and rivers for fishing and swimming. Wanna bet I can swim across? Eustachio boasted. There and back. Or shall we have a race? Sit down already. Augustine laughed. You ate your fill and decided to take a dip. A daredevil, aren't you? Oh, come on, Augustine. Just admit you're not up for it. Eustachio was always adventurous, and Augustine, knowing this, genuinely enjoyed watching his friend. I'm not up for it, he didn't deny it. I'm a sensible person, unlike you. Eustachio grunted in annoyance. Start the timer. He dashed into the water, creating a fountain of splashes. Augustine watched him, alternating between checking his watch and keeping an eye on his friend, who was already halfway across the lake, completely naked. Swim back. He suddenly yelled with genuine alarm. He couldn't explain why he suddenly felt so terrified, especially since Eustachio was an excellent swimmer, almost like a dolphin. They had crossed this very lake many times before, both alone and together, countless times. Yet Augustine suddenly felt an icy chill, as if frost had fallen on him in the middle of a summer night. Eustachio? There was no response. Back. Augustine shouted, now genuinely scared. Swim back, Eustachio. He was already rushing into the water, screaming and calling out to his friend, although he knew deep down that it was futile. Just a little more. He swam, feeling like the familiar lake water, so familiar since childhood, had become thick and viscous like honey. Pushing through it was difficult, and his shoulders ached from the effort. Hold on, Augustine whispered to himself as he swam towards the middle of the lake, where he had last seen Eustachio. Hold on. He took a deep breath and dove. Almost immediately, something silky slipped into his hand. He tightly grasped his friend's hair and forcefully pushed him to the surface. Eustachio gasped for air, convulsively. Idiot! Augustine hissed. You almost drowned, damn it! He swam, supporting his friend, and then dragged him onto the sandy shore. All the while, he couldn't shake the desperate urge to smack Eustachio across his cheek. However, his face was pale and terrified, and Augustine couldn't bring himself to do it. Cramps? He asked. Eustachio grinned self-satisfied, and his eyes twinkled mischievously. 
No, a mermaid pulled me to the bottom. You should have seen her, she had such. He gestured with his hands to indicate which parts of the mermaid's body had particularly impressed him. That's when Augustine couldn't hold back any longer, and the friends burst out laughing loudly, so loud that they startled some bird hiding in the bushes. Thank you, my friend. Eustasio said, still chuckling. You saved my life. Now, I owe you. Augustine silently patted him on the shoulder. They revisited this conversation almost a year later, just before graduation. Remember that debt? Augustine asked, as if in passing. Well, back at the lake. Eustasio looked at him questioningly. I remember. Can't forget something like that. Well then, Augustine continued, give way to Paulina. I know you have feelings for her, but I'm not playing around either. I want to marry her. Eustasio lowered his head. Feelings. Augustine, being a tactful guy, didn't want to say, I know you love her. Love. Can you really do anything against your first love? Eustasio wanted to confess to Paulina, but he was also afraid. What if she mocked him and sent him away with all his tender feelings? Could that happen? Oh, it certainly could. However, deep down, Eustasio still harbored hope that one day they could have an honest conversation, and maybe, just maybe, Paulina might even reciprocate his feelings. But now, Augustine had taken even that hope away from him. Or hadn't he? Eustasio knew for sure that if he ever had to save Augustine, he would never remind him of it. That thought was too frightening, and Eustasio quickly brushed it aside. A debt is a debt, right? Augustine reminded him in a half-whisper. Eustasio turned away. After graduation, I promise I'll move to another city. Paulina got up. Let's go to my place together, she said. I have some new questions for my husband. He acted so despicably back then. He knew everything, and he still did it. Is that fair? And me? I waited for any sign from you, and then Augustine told me that you had a new girlfriend, that you were having such a passionate romance. Seeing the confusion on Eustasio's face, she realized that this had probably been another one of her husband's tricks. And then, she sadly concluded, I decided that, well, the train had left. I agreed to date Augustine. Then I married him. Eustasio sighed and took Paulina's hand in his. Forgive me, he said, gently playing with her fingers. I'm to blame for bringing Nora into your life. If it weren't for that. Stop it, Paulina waved her hand. If it wasn't Nora, it would have been Marina, Luz, or someone else. Your Nora just revealed everything that was hidden, like litmus paper. Remember when they showed it to us in chemistry class? You dip it in a reagent, and it changes color instantly. So, Nora is like that reagent, and Augustine is that very paper. But why are we sitting here? Let's go. No, Eustasio firmly objected. If we want to find out what happened to you, I have to go alone. You wait here for now, all right? There's coffee and some cookies here. If you want, put on a movie and wait for me. I'll be back soon. But for now, you need to remember something. I think someone wanted to get rid of you, to kill you. Isn't that strange? To me. And not to me. If you and Augustine had just gotten divorced, you would have been entitled to half of everything you had managed to accumulate. Someone didn't like that idea. Someone who wanted to have it whole. Nora? Augustine wouldn't. Maybe she is. But to get to the bottom of this, we need them to tell us everything themselves. And that's why we'll do it like this. Listen. Nora stretched out across the marital bed and smiled sweetly at Augustine. Well, isn't my idea great? In just a couple of hours, your wife will wake up, you'll take her home, and she'll tell everyone that she woke up in the morgue. It's enough to pass for complete madness. Then it's off to the psychiatric hospital, a declaration of insanity, guardianship, and voila, you're free. And most importantly, the theater will be all yours. What about Paulina? He hoarsely asked. 
What will happen to her? Augustine didn't share his lover's enthusiasm. In fact, with each passing minute, he felt more and more horrified by what had just happened. And worse yet, he was actively involved in it. How had he even thought of doing this? Disability pension. Nora laughed. What else can happen to her? We'll find her a cozy little nursing home with a nearby forest and a river. And we'll make sure she gets proper care. She could easily live another 50 years. And all in peace and quiet, which is the dream of many, you know. Isn't that lovely? She extended her arms towards him. Well, come here. Augustine smirked crookedly but didn't move towards her. For some reason, he felt a deep sense of dread. Today, Nora had disrupted his wife's plans, and tomorrow, to gain control of the theater, she would quickly figure out how to get rid of him. And she would figure it out, of that he had no doubt. Suddenly, he remembered that a couple of weeks after Nora had appeared in the theater, his wife had complained to him about a string of bad luck. I don't understand what kind of misfortune has befallen us. One of the lead dancers had been hit by a car right near the theater. Now the girl was lying on a stretcher with broken bones, and there was no one to replace her because half of the corps de ballet had some strange allergy. The girls had red, itchy spots all over their bodies and had lined up to see a dermatologist. It might be something in their performance costumes, in the fabric, the doctor said. The girls rewashed their costumes with hypoallergenic detergent, but the strange illness returned within a day. They're scratching themselves to the point of bleeding. Paulina nearly cried in hysteria. Their performance outfits are all open. How can we let girls like this onto the stage? And there's nobody for the leading role. But maybe you could give Nora a chance to prove herself then? He suggested. After all, she's not itching and her legs are intact. Give it a try. Perhaps she'll come up with something remarkable. Paulina sighed and complained a bit, but in the end, she agreed. However, back then, Nora didn't show anything except laziness after the performance she was given. After a somewhat disappointing performance, Paulina moved her back to the corps de ballet. Augustine was deeply disappointed by this. Especially because for two weeks in a row, Nora had been acting angry and barely speaking to him. Why did he suddenly remember this now? Did you criticize that girl back then? He asked in a whisper. Nora gave him a sidelong glance. Laura, I thought you'd figure it out sooner. What choice did I have? Do you think your unstable wife would have given me the leading role? But you could have. He was interrupted by a knock at the door. Eustasio was standing on the threshold. Eustasio, what are you doing here? Augustine, not now. He raised a warning hand. Today, I came for some documents, and the orderly said there was an unknown woman frozen in the morgue. I went to take a look in. I recognized Paulina. What? Augustine exclaimed wildly. Eustasio, are you lying? She's, she is who she is. Are you lying? I'm not lying, Eustasio sadly replied. She died from hypothermia. I don't know what to say, Augustine. Nora turned into a statue in the bedroom doorway. Augustine, she called softly, but he rushed at her with a twisted face full of rage. Nora screamed. Eustasio pounced from behind, pulling his friend away from the girl. This is all her doing. Augustine wailed. She made me do it. What are you talking about? Eustasio yelled at both of them. What have you done? She, she told me it wouldn't be dangerous. She said. Eustasio looked at Nora. What have you done? Was this your idea? The girl shrugged. What the hell was I supposed to do? Should I live like a beggar because this coward is afraid to divorce his mousy wife? Well, why are you staring? Yes, it was my idea. I convinced this slug that his wife wouldn't freeze to death. Would he have agreed if he had known? Augustine suddenly became alert. What will happen now? With all of us? With me? Eustasio, I really didn't want to. 
Do you believe me, Eustasio? I... I didn't want this. Of course, Nora sneered. He didn't want this. He wanted the theater, Paulina at home, and me in the evenings. Isn't that right? Eustasio involuntarily backed away from the girl. He found her so repugnant that he was afraid she might touch him even slightly. Eustasio. Augustine fell to his knees. Have a mercy. What do we do now, Eustasio? Eustasio, what do we do? Shut up. Eustasio snapped. Stop whining. It won't help the situation. We're all going to the morgue together now. We'll pick up the body, and before it gets light, we'll dump it in the river. Who knows what could have happened? Maybe she decided to take a swim, and then a leg cramp got her. Will they believe that? Augustine whimpered. He sat on the floor, running his fingers through his hair. No, no, it won't work like this. Who will believe it? There's no other way, Eustasio said firmly. And in a couple of days, you'll report your wife missing. Until then, let everything run its course. Stand up, Augustine. Get up, and let's go. And you. He looked at the girl. You too. Me? Yes, you too. Augustine jumped to his feet. You came up with all of this, and now you want to bail, huh? Not going to happen. Everyone in the car, quickly. Eustasio lost his patience. They drove for a long time, in silence, interrupted only by Augustine's sobs. He was terrified. Only now did he realize how right Eustasio had been when he warned him against getting involved with Nora. More expensive is what he had said back then. He didn't listen. He thought Eustasio was just being jealous, but it turned out that Nora was a monster who had completely manipulated him and turned him into a murderer. I hate you, he exclaimed. You're a scoundrel. A monster. I hate you. You only think that way, the girl smiled, her usual composure returning. And it will stop seeming that way as soon as you realize how many problems I saved you from. There's no need to stress out in court, get a divorce, and divide assets. Shut up. Augustine shouted. Shut up, you murderer. Both of you, just shut up. Eustasio said from his seat. Both of you. The funeral parlor was well lit. The morgue is down the corridor to the right, Eustasio said. Is she there? Augustine asked with a trembling voice. In the morgue? No. The door to Eustasio's office swung open and Paulina stepped in. Good evening, you scoundrels. Did everything go as planned, Eustasio? Of course, he pulled a recorder from his pocket. It's all here. I think this will be more than enough to send them to places not so far away. No, Augustine whispered, backing up against the wall. No, no, no. He started trembling and fell to his knees, muttering prayers as if chanting no, no, no. Without me, Nora suddenly burst into laughter and dashed across the room towards the door. She's escaping. Paulina gasped. Eustasio shook his head. Don't worry about it. The police are already waiting there. As for him, he nodded with disgust toward Augustine, who had stopped crossing himself and muttering and was now simply whimpering and rocking from side to side. There won't be any need to detain him either. Go in and take the ready one. What's going to happen now? Paulina asked, almost inaudibly, as they led Augustine, who was crying and muttering something again, out of the office. What's going to happen now, Eustasio? He hugged her and patted her on the shoulder. First of all, you need to get some sleep. I won't go home, Paulina shivered. I don't want to go back there ever again. It's not my home anymore. Then let's go to my place, Eustasio said. You can take a bath, get some sleep, and then we'll figure out how to move forward. And what about you? I'll sleep on the couch, just like in the good old days, Eustasio winked at her. And then they drove through the insane city night. Eustasio intentionally didn't rush, because there was still so much they needed to talk about. 
Suddenly, for the first time in years, Paulina felt truly happy because there was a road to travel and Eustasio was right beside her, making her feel safe and at ease. At the end of this nocturnal journey, there awaited her a bath and the opportunity to get some rest. What more could one need for happiness? If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.